I want us to read a passage that is so strikingly uh, similar to John has just uh, done my introduction part for tonight's sermon. Why? Because you will see. Uh, let's uh, look at Book of Colossians, chapter five, verse twenty-five. With a continuation on series of Holy Spirit, um, today's topic is Holy Spirit is a person. Not only He's a spirit, but also He's a person. So let's uh, read uh, this uh, all together. Colossians uh, chapter 5, verse 25, together. Begin. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. That He continually <laughs> walked day and night and walking in the spirit. Uh, so that's... Uh, introductory passage that I was going to talk about. The Holy Spirit is not only the Spirit, He is God Himself, but also He is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. Um, and as we read this passage, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. As we examine this uh, simple passage, Apostle Paul is talking about two desires conflicting each other in our hearts. There are desires of the flesh, and there are desires of the Spirit, and there are works of the flesh, and there are works of the Spirit, and they are conflicting each other in the Christian's hearts and in our lives. But Apostle Paul, as we read in the book of Colossians chapter 5, he says, mortify the desires and works of the flesh. Rather, that you live by the Spirit and in the Spirit. And as he has shared the fruit of the flesh and fruit of the Spirit, then he concludes the topic of conflicting desires in us by saying, if we live in the Spirit. So, we, there's a presumption as a Christians, as a, those people who accepted Christ as a Savior, we live in the Spirit because the Holy Spirit has come inside of us. So the Holy Spirit dwells in us so that we live in the Spirit. But if we are living in the Spirit, but next the challenge is that he is saying, let us also walk in the Spirit. But when we read the original language, in this passage, what he's saying is, in Greek, there is no um, preposition. There is no preposition grammatically. It's all contained in the verb. In Greek words, there is no preposition. Preposition is contained in the verb. When we read the verb, then we will be able to recognize what kind of preposition that is along with context. So what we are saying is, what literally what he's saying is, if we live by the Spirit, or in the Spirit, by the Spirit, with the Spirit, according to context, that we can use proposition that is more accurate along with the context. So what we can say is, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Or we can say, if we live with the Spirit, let us also walk with the Spirit. Nothing wrong with it. It's all understandable, along with the context. And with the English tra translation, that's how we can interpret it. Now, to make this more sensible in our everyday life, in today's culture or in our life, we can understand this. How many of you are married? I think I'm copying John. <laughs> Ask you this question. <laughs> Those are people who are married that we perfectly understand what Apostle Paul is trying to convey to us. If you live with your wife, then also walk with your wife. Husbands, we understand what this means. Because when we are married, the day we are married to our wife, no, my wife, <laughs> that, that we, <laughs> the day I am married to my wife, I live with her. 
I live with her. That doesn't mean I am walking with her daily. That doesn't mean just because I'm married to her, just because I live with her in the same house, that I am legally bounded with her and also relationally, emotionally. But that doesn't mean necessarily I'm walking with her daily. And I think John also sharing his testimony, what he meant, meant by it. I'm living with her, but I may not be walking with her. Because walking with her is more active. It's more active. That I may live with her, but I may not be walking with her. When we walk in old times, when there was no car, a companion will walk together in the road. And as we know that Jesus also walked with his disciples on the road of Emmaus. And he was conversing with his disciples. So a person walks another person and by walking is a very active. There's a goal ahead of you and you are approaching to that goal. And there's a purpose in that walking. And also not only that, you enjoy that com companionship. You enjoy that communion and you are talking with your spouse. You are fully engaging with your spouse. That's what it means if we are to exhort our husbands, not only that you should live with your wife, but you should also walk with your wife. That means a fully engaging communication, communion, enjoying intimacy with her and fellowship with her. Just like that, Apostle Paul is asking us, if you live in the spirit, yes, you do so. And you are living in the spirit because you already accepted Christ as a, as a Messiah and the Holy Spirit dwells in you. So all Christians, we are living in the spirit. But if so, not only you stop there, but more actively you should walk with the Holy Spirit. That's what he's saying to us. Now, walking in our days because we are not familiar with you know, we don't stroll with our companion, our spouse, with our friends too long by walking. But even in today's culture, when we drive on the passenger seat, we may have our wife. And as we are driving, what do we do? Do we just uh, let her sit right next to us and just uh, be silent and we're minding ourselves and I need to go to a shopping mall here and there and I'm driving for an hour or so? No, while we are driving, we converse with her. So it's an active involvement, active communion with the Holy Spirit, hearing him and understanding where he wants to take us, where he wants to go with us. In a way, it's yoked oxen. The oxen are yoked together. And they walk together. They work together. And they plow together. And there is a purpose. There is a sense of accomplishment doing it together and sharing communication like that. And with the Holy Spirit, we must actively walk with him. Why? Because he is a person. Because he is another person. Not only he is a God, but he's also spirit, but he's also a person. And we walk with him intimately. And as I continually pray for this message and pray for us, there's a deep sense of desire within me as I intercede for you is that all of us gain understanding, not only just a head understanding who Holy Spirit or what he does, is that we gain such a longing and desire that we want to intimately walk with the Holy Spirit moment by moment that I am more aware of what he's doing in my life and I want to be led by him and also I want to hear his voice. Yesterday, I decided to change the oil of my wife's car, Honda Accord, because this a brand new car, recent cars, they use a synthetic engine oil rather than conventional engine oil. And synthetic engine oil is much more expensive. And when I took the car, because before I used to know a KM church member who had an a auto shop, and he would just charge me $20 for minivan or Honda Accord and anything like that. Now he closed it down. 
I guess I didn't promote his shop too much. I should carry his business card and distribute it to other members. But anyways, I was looking, and I found some auto shop, and he will ask me $65 for oil change. That's expensive, and his reasoning was because this needs SW0-20, and it's a synthetic, and oil is much more expensive. And $65 for oil change, you know, I used to change oil by myself, and, and I was tempted to do it again by myself. And so I went to the, the, the oil part shop and got oil, and that was expensive, about $40 altogether, five quarts, and, and the filter that I'm changing it 9 p.m. in the dark. And all my kids are excited. <laughs> they all come out to the parking lot and I'm changing it. And I don't have anything else except the jack, that emergency jack to change a tire. Now I'm looking at it to save $30, I'm risking my neck. <laughs> and my wife absolutely has no idea. So I want to save time. So my son, older son, 10 years old son, wants to help me. Dad, I know how to check this car up. So can I do it? Okay, you do it. So he's cranking the car up. But before doing so, it's already at night. I'm tired, and I want to do this in 30 minutes. But I don't know where engine tanker is located, right? So I read a manual. And it doesn't say, because normally, the previous cars that I change the oil will be on the right. So if I'm facing the car, it'll be usually on the right. So I don't want to twice again to check up the car and look, behind, look underneath where, where the engine tank is located and things like that. So to save time, then promptly, I have a Holy Spirit. I can ask Holy Spirit, well, is a... Where, which side is located, right? Yeah. Amen? No? <laughs> Amen? <laughs> so, dear Holy Spirit, where is it? Should I do the left or to the right? Holy Spirit says left. But my, with my own experience, it's been always on the right. And that's my gut too. But I'm asking, it's on the left side. So I'm wrestling a little bit, and I obeyed. Holy Spirit, guess where the tanker was located? Yes, it was a left. <laughs> of course it was a left. <laughs> I will still share it because my son will lift the car up. While I'm doing it, I'm not still convinced because I, my preference, my experience, my knowledge was so strong and I gave in and I obeyed, but I still was so doubtful. You know what I did? Sorry, I broke media fast. I look into YouTube, <laughs> how to change oil change on Honda Accord. <laughs> While that was happening, my son who jacked up the car, put it in the wrong position, and it worked crumble down. Oh, Lord. <laughs> but anyways, a long story short, I finally was able to change the oil chain, oil of the car. But even little things like that, where is the oil tank located, left or right, with the small things or larger things in our life, the Holy Spirit is there and trying to help us. And it's a very personal is a very personal. He walks intimately with us. And some people may say, just take it, take your car to the auto shop and pay 30 extra dollars about whatever decisions I made under that circumstance. And if I ask, he's more than willing to answer my question and he's willing to help me. But there was another occasion this week that has happened. KKLA, do you know what KKLA is? It's a Christian radio station. Their office is located in Glenda. And randomly, the person who is one of the directors will call me, and he says, I'm looking for 
Korean American pastor who speaks Korean and will have a podcast on Sunday. And I go, where did you get my number? And we, we were looking for a Korean American church and we found you. But I don't have my number on the website. I don't know how. But anyways, he says, um, so we'd like to uh, broadcast your ministry. And it will help you and all that. And he's uh, saying this. And you can do either way. You can come to our office and do the voice recording. Or you can edit your Sunday sermon and do it every Sunday and things like that. So how much does it require and, and things like that? And he said it and, and so forth. And I will get back to you. But in the meantime, you can visit our office and by curiosity, and I wanted to see how it goes. Because this was not the first time. There was a certain TV station wanting to do this and things like that. For this purpose, asking God, God, is this from you? Is this something you desire? And I'm praying. Guess what? God is saying. Who said no? Huh? Okay. Yeah, it was a no. <laughs> there was a certain desire in my heart. And that was more difficult than asking God to whether oil tank is located to the left and to the right. Because if I was wrong, then I can just uh, do it one more time. And it's not that bad. But asking him... And my sermon broadcast every Sunday in KKLA. They claim they have the largest uh, listeners in the nation. And you can be tempted. And as a pastor, and it can be edifying the ministry and grow, opportunity to grow the ministry and things like that. And when you have a stronger preference in your heart, it becomes difficult, more difficult to listen to the voice of Holy Spirit. So I wrestled a little bit. But I obey. Amen? Praise God. But a lot of you here, you're contemplating in your heart. Are you hearing voice of God clearly or kind of thing? But anyways, he's a personal. He's a personal. Our desire is to walk with him intimately, daily, and moment by moment because he's in us. Imagine ourselves, Jesus is walking in our streets, streets in the city of Fullerton. If we know he's a for sure the Messiah, the Messiah we've been waiting for, and he can be available to me to talk with me and to pray for me and to minister to me, what would I do? Would I just let him slide in my life and that I know he's walking in the commonwealth and he's willing to meet with me? What would I do? Would I just do my daily business and eat alone and do the things and make a decisions by myself where I know that Jesus is walking in my street and when I go to him and he can make myself, he can him. Make himself available. Among all the crowd, he may be busy, but every time I call his name, he will just pull away from the crowd and come to me, shine. I want you to do this and that. The struggle that you are having, this way you can solve this problem. This is what I want you to do. If I can hear his voice in such a way, would I just let him slide? No, absolutely not. None of us in this room Knowing the physical Jesus walking in the streets, that we will not let him go. We will all cling to him and run to him and grab his hands and commune with him and invite him to our place and have a dinner. If it is all possible, sleep on my bed and I want to be with you 24-7. That will be our desire. But he has done so. 2,000 years ago, he came to world in the physical form. Jesus is God himself who came to the world in the physical form. And Holy Spirit is God himself who came to me and you in the world in the spiritual form. And he's 24-7 available, but we ignore him. And we let him just slide. He's always with us. He's always with us. And when I share this testimony with you, how that I will ask Holy Spirit where the oil tank is located, you may be offended. What kind of Christianity is it? 
Is it weird? No, absolutely not. Because he loves us, because he's in us, because he cares for us, because he's interested of whatever we are doing, small or large, that he can direct us, he can tell us who my spouse will be, and he can tell me what to eat for next lunch. If we are willing to intimately walk with him. If you live with your wife, walk with your life, wife. Because every decision husband makes, sometimes they can be so foolish and they disregard their spouse. And as if they're leading single life. And we ignore them. We disregard them. Quite often, husbands are foolish enough to do that. We as Christians are foolish enough to ignore the presence of God. God himself who came inside of us and every one of us and he's walking with us. And he has that willingness, but we ignore him so often and most of the time. But he is a person. That he is the person. He is the person who longs and desires to intimately walk with him. Do we have that desire? Do we have that strong desire? Do we have that desire? I always ask this question. If God will guarantee me one answer to my prayer request, we know we already have that guarantee. If you shall ask anything in my name and I will do it. That's what he said. But other than that, hypothetically, whether you are asking anything lustfully or spiritually, it doesn't matter. For one thing, if you shall ask, I will do it. If there is one guarantee from the Lord, what would I ask God? I quite often meditate upon that. And what would I desire? Would I ask God for a billion dollars? Would I ask God for sending our kids to Harvard school? Would I ask for a billion dollars worth of house? Whatever it can be. But what will be our desire? I remember Pastor Kim many times sharing this illustration. I believe this is a German folk tale. There's Tinkerbell who came to an old couple. They were so poor. And the, the Tinkerbell came to the old couple and said to them, I will grant you three wishes. Whatever you ask, three wishes. No reservation, no string attached. And I will grant you three wishes. And these are two couples. I don't exactly remember how the story goes. These are two t couples just to contemplate and, and what, think, thought hard what to ask from Tinkerbell. And then they got hungry. And the husband said, oh, I wish I had a sausage. Then sausage on the plate appeared. One out of three wishes was gone for the sausage. And the wife got so upset, so angry. How can you waste the one wish over a sausage? And she got so upset, so angry. Let this sausage stuck to your nose. That wish came true. So sausage got stuck to the husband's nose. So what did they have to ask for third wish? Take off the sausage from the husband's nose. But anyways, we can waste our wishes and our desires in such a foolish manner. But if there's a one guarantee from the Lord, and I will always debate between two desires. One will be, Lord, more of your presence in my life. Greater anointing in my life. More of the Holy Spirit. Or give me the word. Give me the word. Give me the entire nation's as an inheritance. And I will debate over between two. But I think if I ask more of measurement of his spirit, and I think it will come together with the nations because it will take a power of the Holy Spirit to really, really receive the nations as an inheritance. You know, it's so interesting. Today, as I was a contemplating and praying 
with this passage, Colossians 5.25. And I want to attest to myself. Today, I really want to be intentional and mindful that I want to walk with you. When I have a meeting with other brothers and sisters, whatever I say, I want to be led by the Spirit. And moment by moment, I want to be in intentional and I want to acknowledge your presence and your leading and all that. And even for this worship, as I was praising God uh, with a praise team, and I was praying that too. Lord, let this night of spirit and fire, let, it not, let me not put in a structure that I ask Holy Spirit come into this format of worship. That I want to be led by the Spirit and let you be in charge. Now, how tonight happened. <laughs> so even all my sermon preparation <laughs> has been all shifted and shuffled. <laughs> so we'll have to pray. <laughs> Let's all stand. Because the Holy Spirit is a person, meaning he has also emotion, will, and intellect. That's how know, we know that he's a person. The reason why we are a person, having, having emotion, will, and intellect, is because God himself is a person. He has emotion, will, and intellect. And so does the Holy Spirit. And because the Holy Spirit is a person, He also has a strong desire. As a person, whether we recognize it or not, all of us as a persons, we have this one desire. We want to love and we want to be loved. There's a tremendous longing for communion. There's a tremendous longing for intimacy. And because the Holy Spirit is a person, he will go and manifest strongly in a place where he is most welcome. And the way that we can be filled with the Holy Spirit after baptism of the Holy Spirit, that is, after we accept Christ as the Savior, the first time the Holy Spirit comes in us, that we call theologically baptism of the Holy Spirit. But the filling of the Holy Spirit is a continual process that I may be filled with the Holy Spirit today, but tomorrow I may not be. But because He is a person, He will dwell in the heart where He is most welcome. This morning, after early morning prayer, as I went into office on the desk, there was a note written and the Kleenex. It was my daughter. The old, my daughter, Ellen. And he said, I brought it, so let me read it for you. In her own writing, with a large heart, said, Hi, this is Ellen. I just wanted to tell you that I love you. And P.S. I also want to say that you are special. But on that special, A is missing. <laughs> Just like her dad, she has to work on spelling. <laughs> that as soon as I read that, that just a piece of Kleenex made my, my day. My day so happy. But my heart was yearning after my daughter. With her sweetness that she left this note. Because yesterday when I was not in the office after the school, mom brought them 
for a moment because my son was uh, practicing football, and during those times while I was gone, they were staying in the in my office, and that's when she probably wrote that. That my heart was just chasing after her, yearning after my daughter's heart, with a, such a pleasure, with a, such a joy. The Holy Spirit is like so. When we yearn after Him, when we desire Him, when we love Him, His heart, because He's a person also, will just come and run to us and manifest and fill our hearts and fully blossom in our hearts, in our life. How much do you desire Him? How much do you long for Him? How much do we crave for Him? How much do we hunger and thirst after Him? He is God. He is a spirit. And He is also a person. If there's one guaranteed prayer request, no matter what will be answered, I will ask God more of the Spirit more of you can it be this prayer tonight we don't have much time until 10 but can we really cry out to him if I don't have that much of desire can I ask God Lord increase my desire increase my thirst increase my th hunger increase my longing for you God who came to me and dwells in me, the Holy Spirit. This is our desire and my desire. Let's call on the name of Jesus three times and pray. One, two, three. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The Father, the Holy Spirit.